You are listening to the Quarter Transmissions Episode 81. And now, here are Craig and Jeff. And welcome to episode 81 of the Tricorder Transmissions. We are your hosts, Jeff Hewlett. And Craig Cohen. And Jeff, this week we've actually, uh, we're not doing our series wrap-up yet because that is a, a series that has taken some extra time to put together. But we do have something very special. Yes, this week's show is going to answer a question that's been uh, asked of us many, many times. And that is, what direction are we going in? Once the original series is completed, and we're happy to announce today is going to be a little bit of a different style of show. Uh, this isn't a commentary, but we're going to be talking about the first issue of the Gold Key Comics. That is the Planet of No Return. Yeah, or as the uh, the cover calls it, KG Planet of Death. Yes, yes, <laughs> a very ominous cover, but so. What we're going to be doing, uh, this is going to be a little experimental. This is the first time we've done this on this show. Uh, we have another show that we kind of operate this way, so we're trying to take that format and bring it here. Uh, we're going to be investigating some of the, the, the writer and the illustrator of this comic, and then we're going to be kind of talking through the comic in sections. So uh, this this is spoilerific here, so uh, if, if any of you are worried about spoilers, if you haven't read this thing and you don't want to spoil it, so just you know stop this episode, pause it, whatever you're going to do, go find a copy of this thing, read it, and then come back because we're going to talk about the entire plot from beginning to end. And actually, I do believe that what IDW recently yes. um, reprinted these as, I think, a two-volume set, the Gold Key Archives, I believe. Yeah, it is available in physical and digital formats. Um, I have the digital format of the first volume. And uh, it's it's really good. They've restored it. It's absolutely beautiful. Uh, I've, I've also seen the um, scans of the old original comic so the the new enhanced versions that idw put out look really really cool in comparison to uh, what the the older versions look like but uh, they've been around for a long long time and uh, some of these early ones are actually worth quite a bit of money at this point if you got near mint copies of them yeah highly highly collectible and i, I think the the most interesting thing we should talk about is even though this issue came out after the series was on the air, it came out in, what, July 1967, mm -hmm. they had started work on this before the series had hit the air. Exactly. So while there are some similarities to the show, there are also quite a number of differences. Uh, a lot of terminology is different in this comic, and we're pointing a lot of those things out as we talk through it. Uh, I find a lot of this really, really fascinating, and some of the characters are uh, like they are on the show, and some of them are not. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, other information about this before we get started like Craig said this came out in July of 1967 uh, written by uh, Dick Wood the artist is Nevio Zakara, and the star date for this issue is 1809.2 and when it came out the cover price was a paltry 12 cents so that's nothing compared to what comics cost today yeah. Uh, some of the footnotes uh, about this are it was published by KK Publications in Poughkeepsie, New York, uh, designed, produced and printed in the USA by Western Printing and Lithographing Company, uh, copyright 67 by Desilu Productions. Mm. Yeah, pretty cool. You have some info on uh, the writer Dick Wood, Craig? Yeah, Dick Wood was a comic book writer, and he his career ran from the 1940s through – the mid seventies, he started working on action comics in the nineteen oh, fifties cool. before moving to Gold Key in the sixties. And at Gold Key, he was the primary writer of Doctor Solar, 
Man of the Atom from 65 through the end of its run in 69. And in addition to The Planet of No Return, he wrote um, seven additional issues of the Star Trek Gold Key comic book. Oh, very cool. So Nevio Zakara is the illustrator of this issue, and uh, he made his comic debut in 1952. Uh, with uh, some aviation and fantasy stories for an Italian run called, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Il Vittorioso. So in the 60s, he did some erotic work in some other Italian uh, comic strips, and uh, he joined the Giolitti studio and began production of the foreign market, most notably Star Trek for the United States. Uh, He did some work in the British comic market, where he did a comic called Battler Britain, for thriller comics, uh, some war stories in War Picture Library, and something called The Phantom for Five. Uh, in the 70s, he was back in Italy, though. Uh, he was doing something called Max Martin, uh, back with some of his old cohorts. Uh, throughout the 70s and 80s, he was still uh, working in the Italian comic book market, several different series there, with a lot of names I would probably have a lot of trouble pronouncing. In 1996, he started a series called Metal City, and I believe he passed away in the mid 2000s. Yeah. So that covers the writer and the illustrator for this episode. So some interesting cover and an inner text on the first page here that I thought was pretty cool. Uh, so the cover, as uh, Craig was saying, it says an expedition team discovers its secret too late. KG Planet of Death. Yeah. And this is a photo cover. Yep. Um, and it would later be reprinted with a really cool comic book style cover um, that's sort of got the the plant villains. So if you, I, I guess in the show notes, we'll, we'll provide a link to, uh, I guess, information on this, on this issue. Sure. Yep. There's, yeah, the multiple covers and the original cover had uh, Spock with like a, a beaker of fluid in his hand. Uh, yeah. And Kirk and Sulu and Sulu's not even in this and, issue, yeah. right? <laughs> nope. <laughs> nope. Uh, so let's see. The inside cover has a, an interesting lead in uh, to the series, which uh, I, I, I was kind of surprised because this did come out. They did have source material uh, in the TV show, but the way that they worded this is very strange. It says, uh, this is the Enterprise, a ship of the Starfleet. Starfleet, two two separate words. It's five-year mission in space to probe the far reaches of the galaxy, to search the unknown and unlock its mysteries, to boldly go where no man has ever gone before. Yeah, it seems like an early sort of run at that, um, you know, before it was edited down and made more concise and uh, and more iconic. Yeah, I, it's it's interesting because some of the you when you watch, when you read the comic and you look at the way they've illustrated the characters, they they pretty much match their likenesses on the television show. So it was obvious that the artist had seen the show, but I guess maybe it was written. Uh, prior to a lot of these things being solidified, and I guess it took time for them to to produce the actual artwork and the writing for this. So maybe that was by the time they had gotten it done, things had changed. Yeah. So uh, page one synopsis reads: It was the strangest civilization in all the known universe, more awesome than the mind of man could conceive. And the expedition team from the star spaceship USS Enterprise soon regretted their decision to explore KG. Dot, yeah, dot, and this dot. is really cool. It's a, um, it's sort of a, a very un Star Trek like teaser in the sense that we're getting an indication of the threat uh, that's looming. Uh, Star Trek very rarely, if at all, did uh, did time jumps like that. No, yeah, usually you got a little teaser at the beginning to wet your whistle. You didn't get an expose that something horrible was going to happen before it actually happened, right? Yeah. So. All right, well, are you ready to jump into uh, talking about this issue? Yeah. All right, so we're not going to do a three count anymore because we're not doing a commentary, but what I'm going to do instead is I'll do a countdown to spoilers starting. So yeah. if you if you want to stop and read the comic, uh, stop this podcast in three, two, one. All right, you had your chance. Uh, we are getting into the, the talking points of this episode now. So... In, in the first phase of this story, the Enterprise is uh, on a mission to explore uh, Galaxy Alpha, kind of nondescript, and it hasn't discovered any life uh, until they pick up a green planet on the scanners, and Kirk orders a close-up, and it turns out to be a planet that is uh, steeped in heavy vegetation, 
Kirk uh, decides to go a little bit closer and orders a landing party. And uh, while closing in on the planet, the ship passes through uh, a, a fog in space, and it turns out to be some spores from the, the plant life on the planet below. And the spores kind of they permeate through the hull of the ship and wind up seeping into all different areas of the ship itself. Uh, Spock and McCoy are gathering some supplies when uh, in a laboratory area they notice some of the ship's uh, guinea pigs that they apparently used to do some experiments on have been taken over by the spores and mutate into giant aggressive uh, plants. So the plants are kind of going on a rampage for a little while and uh, the security team winds up coming in and, and, and burning them down with the phasers and uh, that's kind of where we get the setup of what's going to be happening down on the planet. So uh, they've averted the threat on the ship, but are getting ready to go down to the planet's surface. So, uh, Craig, do you have any thoughts on this beginning section? It actually feels a lot like something we would have seen on this show where we get this cloud they go through and these spores permeating through the, the, the hull of the ship is a little a little much. But overall, the setup seems, you know, very Star Trek to me. The, the one interesting thing here is the artwork where Spock is wearing his standard blue mm -hmm. tunic. But a lot of the shots, McCoy looks like he's wearing almost uh, Kirk's dress gear. Yeah. Did you, did you notice that the, the red shirt is nowhere to be seen in this as well? Scotty's in a yellow shirt. Yeah. So I, I'm not sure what the deal was with the with the colors because I, I at first I thought maybe they had a limited ink palette for uh, the printing of the comic, but there are other things in the comic that are red, mm -hmm. so that couldn't be it. So I, I'm I'm wondering if this is another one of those things where um, it, they were basing it on a very early thing that they had seen. Maybe they saw uh, where no man has gone before the pilot episode because uh -huh. I don't believe there were red shirts in that. It was only blue and gold. Yeah. So maybe they based the colors of the uniforms on that. And yet McCoy's uniform seems a little bit inconsistent throughout this. He keeps changing. Sometimes it looks like uh, almost like a dress uniform and other times it looks like a standard, you know, a standard shirt. The one other thing here is I think, you know, from the start here, Spock seems very Spock-like in terms mm -hmm. of, you know, he talks about having um, after they sort of, work through the the action of the the guinea pigs being turned into plants but then he talks about observing them and um they have to know the cause to find the cure um so it seems like right now at least the writers got a handle on the spot character which i don't think will be the case through the remainder of the issue True, I agree. There's a, there's another moment later on where he's definitely the Spock that we know from the show, and then there's other moments where he's that sort of uh, uneven, sort of kind of emotional Spock from uh, where no man has gone before. So interesting uh, changes in the character and, and how some of it bears resemblance to what we know and some of it doesn't. There's a couple of terminology things in this uh, beginning section that I thought were cool to point out. One is... Early on, they talk about a space scope. The planet shows up on the space scope, which I guess in, in the show are, are just scanners. Mm -hmm. It's referred to as scanners. And also there's a, a reference to a TV scanner. Kirk wants to see something on the TV scanner. <laughs> yes. So, uh, again, another thing that is simplified on the show is just scanners. I, think, I don't think they actually mention TV on the show at all. So No couple of interesting terminology differences, and there's a bunch more coming up later that we'll be yeah. pointing out. Another thing that stood out to me, Craig, during this opening section is that they have live animals on the ship that they do experiments on. They have guinea pigs, and we don't yeah. see that. Aside from the pink dog with the horn, uh, we don't see live animals on the ship at all. No. And actually what? They referenced that they think that the, this was caused by, or we're going to learn in the next scene what uh, what Spock thinks happened. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, we we stopped just short of that, but yeah. Uh, a couple other things that I'll point out before moving on. Uh, on on panel number five on the first page, for anybody who's following along out there, uh, it shows uh, the spores in space attaching to the hull of the ship, and this made me think about something that we talked about before when we talk about things about the animated series. 
is that obviously in the comic books, they took the same approach that they did with the animated show, and they're doing things that they couldn't necessarily have done on the television show uh, back then because it would have been too costly or not even possible to do with the uh, the level of effects that they had available to them at the time. So uh, having you know particles fly and attach themselves to the hull of the ship and permeate through, as well as having uh, plants, uh, um, animals morph into plants, wasn't something that was necessarily possible or, or within the realm of the budget of the show. So kind of cool that they're taking that liberty uh, with yeah. the comic, right? Mm-hmm. So I thought no, that was agreed. really cool. And uh, uh, before, one more thing before we move into when, uh, something that popped into my mind, that the security team used phasers uh, to cut down the trees and stop them. And I thought it was really cool that the phasers haven't been disabled <laughs> by some sort yeah. of uh, you know disruption that the plants had. Because on the show, we always goof around about how they're always disabling all this cool technology. But uh, yeah. in this comic, the phasers, thankfully, don't ever get disabled, and they're able to use them. Uh, to help escape from the situation. So moving on. So uh, Kirk calls an emergency conference. This is very reminiscent of the show. We've seen this on the show a million times. So Kirk calls Spock and McCoy in to discuss uh, what's going on. And uh, we hear that a couple of weeks ago, they had some uh, laboratory animals they were doing some work on, and they may have picked up alien spores. So Kirk orders Spock to continue doing some research on his theory while they beam down to the planet's surface. Enter Yeoman Janice Rand, making her appearance in this issue, which is kind of cool. And a couple of uh, security guards get to go down as well. And as they go down, he tells Spock, I thought this was kind of cool, another terminology uh, terminology thing, as they want an hourly TV radio report yeah. sent back to the ship. So, um, And we also have the D hour. Yes, the D hour. Good call. Which is the, the departure time. Yes, nice. So another thing we don't ever hear about. So one other, another, before we go into our thoughts on this part, another cool terminology is that they talk about the teleportation chamber. It's not referred to as, you know, the transporter pads or the transporter. Uh, it's uh, just referred to as the teleportation chamber. So more differences in, in terminology and also the look of the transporter is different too. It, it's more of a, a circular uh, station in the middle of a room with sort of a glass enclosure around it. So y- y- you wonder they had source material, of course, to draw these characters, but they didn't take the the look of the transporter and use that in the comic. And we all, we also get in this sequence, the first very unspock like moment where he says, uh, as they're about to beam down, we will anxiously be awaiting your word, Captain. May luck be with you. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that is where I don't Spock. think Spock has ever uh, been anxious, and um, s- the idea of Spock believing in luck as well. Yeah, uh, agreed, agreed, and and we're gonna get another one of these Spock moments with the uh, when they beam back to the ship later. That kind of threw me for a little bit of a loop, but uh, interesting that they um, that Spock is so different in this this portion but they took the trinity of kirk spock and mccoy having a, a sit down and a discussion about the situation and what they were going to be doing which is very reminiscent of the show so it's weird how they they were cherry picking certain things to put into the comic but not other things yeah you know uh, another thing they talk a little bit more about doing testing on lab animals which really stuck out to me because you never ever hear about that Mm-hmm. on the television show really so uh kind of struck me as odd that they would include something like that i guess they had to have something that morphed into a plant so uh, you know we're gonna see a person do it down on the planet surface but i guess on the on the ship they had to have you know something i guess to transform right yeah yeah because uh, a crew member would have been i think to um it would have been tipping their hand right yeah yeah they, they're gonna wait another couple pages before yeah. that so the other thing um on this page that i've noticed is janice is wearing like a little cap yeah <laughs> and it fits her her hairdo yeah very well so she doesn't just let her hair go down when she goes uh, on an away mission she keeps her hairdo but just puts like a skull cap over it yeah i wonder if the artist was just like i don't want to be bothered drawing this detailed hair <laughs> you're probably right because it had that crisscross pattern right the tablecloth yeah. pattern on it uh. oh man 
So, but you know, the, the likeness of Rand is pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. They obviously put some effort into getting her as close to, uh, the real Janice Rand as possible. And I, I thought the Spock and McCoy likenesses were really good too. Kirk, not so much. Yeah. Kirk's a little spotty. Yeah. But McCoy and, and Spock look very, very good. Scotty, you only see from a profile. So he's, he doesn't quite fit, but he's close, but not quite there. And one other thing about this, um, the landing party, is they are wearing the the away uh, team suits. Yeah, with the big belt buckles. Yeah, that we sort of saw, I guess, in, in the cage. Yeah, that brownish-gray mm-hmm. jumpsuit uh, with the neck piece. It kind of has that, that like little neck that, that goes up a little bit. It's pretty cool looking, and I, I, you wonder why they didn't use them more on the show. It makes sense that you would wear something other than your just, you know, normal, everyday on you know on board um gear yeah you would think something a little more protective because you're going into an unknown environment right yeah so moving along uh in the next section the landing party is down on the surface of the planet uh planet kg i guess named after scotty's comments on the bridge uh and they start to search around and a uh one of the crewmen passes through yet another mysterious mist kind of like the ship passed through in space and of course he turns into a plant himself so i guess we see that these spores have a, a almost a borg like property to them they can seep into your skin and immediately change you into one of them the crew members are then assaulted by a gigantic plant that's a i guess a man-eating giant plant uh, which has some sort of a suction power that can can suck them in and uh, before they're devoured they're saved by a, another a giant tree that attacks the, the cannibal plant. They have a little bit of a plant altercation between the two of them. Turns out that the, the, the plant that saved them was uh, Crewman Hunt, and uh, he passes away, unfortunately. Yeah, but he was, able, he was able to retain some of his humanity before he died. Yeah, and they, they wind up burying him, the, the remains of his new uh, tree-like body, in a shallow grave which is kind of sad but i guess we saw that in the galileo 7 right on the yeah. show mm-hmm. when crewmen uh, died you know on planet they buried them there yeah and actually the the evil plant did it uh did it remind you of seymour from a little it shop did. of horrors it very much did because it had that sort of a clamshell yeah. look to it right it kind of looked mm-hmm. like a red pac-man yeah <laughs> yeah yeah so but you know this is this is really cool because this is one of those things that you know, in, in, in the, the late 60s, they could not have done oh, no. on the television show. You couldn't have these two giant plants, you know, battling each other in a convincing way. I mean, sure, we've seen, you know, high sci-fi movies and things, uh, you know, from the 50s and 60s that had, you know, weird looking, you know, Day of the Triffids and whatnot with the weird, uh, you know, plant-like creatures. But it would not, would not have been nearly as convincing as it, it needed to be. Yeah, and it would have probably entailed some very time-intensive stop motion work exactly exactly and that would have been way way out of the budget uh for for i I could see it being done in a very clash of the titans kind of way yeah that would actually be kind of cool a little harryhausen effect yeah but it probably would have taken the majority of the season to uh, to do that (laughs) 30 second fight yeah exactly but but you know that's that's one of the benefits of the comic book and the animated series they would be able to do stuff like this and uh you you see a little more of janice rand's little beanie hat (laughs) Yeah. Uh, in these scenes. And of course, we have uh, the the security detail guy dying, which is very similar to what we see on the show, mm-hmm. although he's not in a red shirt. Uh, yeah. But this is the red shirt effect being carried into the comic books. So, Craig, any thoughts on this section? No, I think, you know, while we were going through it, I pretty much um, hit everything I wanted to, to, to cover. OK, so moving right along. Kirk calls back to the ship and, and informs Spock of, of what's happened. So very, uh, another throwback to the show. Uh, but, of course, he decides to stay on the planet and find out what's causing these plant attacks. So this is very Kirk-like. I mean, how many times have you seen Kirk do stuff like this on the show and uh, make these ill-advised moves to stay in a dangerous situation? So Yeah, and they're actually doing it. They're communicating uh, over video. Exactly. Yeah, it's something that we don't see on the show which is pretty cool there's a little bit more of this later on too so the party keeps walking around these forests and they come upon a like a village of sorts where the plants have houses and are walking around they're like bipedal plants 
so they have a an almost a human type civilization, and uh, the Captain Kirk, of course, realizes that they're there's an intelligent society, and uh, tries to get in for a closer look. But of course, they're suddenly attacked again uh, by more trees, and the, they're able to use their phasers to blast down a bunch of them and and escape. As they're running for their lives, they jump into a cave to, to try to hide and use it as a shelter. But, of course, the, the, the plants are not to be undone. And a giant crawling vine grabs a hold of Yeoman Rand and essentially kidnaps her. And the crew gives chase only to find that Crewman Rand has been put into a live cattle pen uh, ending part one of the comic on a cliffhanger. <laughs> uh, I, I like the cliffhanger, but we get some more really um, weird un Star Trek dialogue where they get to the cave and Janice Rand says, I'm exhausted. And then Kirk replies, Steady, honey, I know it's been rough. <laughs> yeah, I, I wrote that down myself that <laughs> Kirk calls her honey. I love that. <laughs> Very un Kirk like. Yeah. But pretty cool. Another another very strange dialogue bit that that struck me is while Rand is getting grabbed by the tentacles, Kirk exclaims, "Great Hannah!" <laughs> yeah, we what get the a heck lot does of that those mean? Throughout the rest of the issue, we get a lot of those. I don't know if they were watching Batman or something. We get a lot of those great Hannah moments. I have no idea. If anybody out there in listener land knows what Great Hannah means, please let us know. Was that a thing in the sixties? You, that, that was an exclamation in the 60s. You know, you, you dropped your soda at the movie. The Great Hannah. I don't know. But uh, some cool stuff, though. Kirk does some phaser heroics, right? Shooting some of the plants that are chasing him. Get some, some compliments from, from Dr. McCoy on his, uh, his handiwork with the phaser. And I really like the fact that they had a sentient society of plants. I think that would have been such a cool thing to have on the show. Yeah. You know, if, if they did a... If the original series was remade as a TV show today with the the CG that we have, this is something they definitely could do oh, and totally. do it in a convincing way. And I would love to see something like that. Yeah. So so pretty cool. So the, the – and, you know, it's interesting that the comic book has a break in the middle where it says, you know, end of part one yeah, and kind of gives you a cliffhanger. <laughs> All you have to do is, of course, turn the page. But uh, I, I like where they give you a break where you can kind of say, okay – I'm going to stop reading at this point. I'm going to put the comic book down. I'm going to go think about this for a while and come yeah, back. Or I'm going to go get a sandwich or use yeah. the bathroom or. Why not? Yeah. Next, we're, we're going to come back to part two of the story. And uh, we see that Yeoman Rand has been put into this cattle pen. It's made of a, a big ring of thorns. And she's deposited inside. And there are other animals in there. They kind of look like little dinosaurs of a sort. And, you know, the landing party is attempting to use their phasers to cut through the thorns, but they regenerate too quickly, and they can't break their way into where Janice Rand is to try to save her. And we see Kirk guesses that the larger plants are using the animals and, of course, Janice Rand as a food source. So there is, um, there's almost a hierarchy going on here where there's some lesser plants that the uh, the greater plants use as food for the animals uh, to fatten them up in order to eat the animals themselves. So right. uh, Kirk calls back up to the Enterprise and orders Spock to fire a pinpoint uh, laser blast at the wall of the pen so that they can get inside in order to attempt to uh, save Janice Rand. So there's a lot of terminology in this section, which I thought really bared pointing out. Uh, one of which is uh, the uh, Spock refers to a laser beam destruct ray. Yes. Which is nothing more than the Enterprise phasers being used on the planet's surface. So I guess they wanted to come up with a name uh, for, for that particular function. So uh, laser beam destruct ray. Pretty cool. Uh, the phasers are referred to as blast guns. Mm -hmm. You notice that. So they make a reference to them not being strong enough to destroy the thorn fence. So the interesting that the word phaser was used in the show and they had that source material, but they opted not to use the word phaser. And another thing that Spock was talking about while he's trying to line up the, uh, the shots is he mentioned celestial latitude and longitude. 
Yes. I don't remember ever hearing those on the show. I, no. I, I would think they would use them because they sound pretty good, but but they never use those terms on the show. And in terms of laser beam versus phaser, I think it's probably also the uh, intended audience hmm. um, where they probably assume that more kids were going to be reading this than possibly the demographic that was actually watching the show. So you get a little less hard sci-fi, if you will, and just, mm -hmm. you know, the, the terminology laser beam is a lot easier for maybe a, a young mind to digest. Good point. Good point. I hadn't, hadn't thought about it that way, but that does explain some of it. Uh, let's see what else happens. And oh, there's an interesting piece of technology in, in use here. Kirk, has a set of stellar binoculars yeah, yes. that we never see used on the show. They actually almost look like the binoculars that the Rebels were using on Hoth in Empire totally. Strikes Back, don't they? Yes, I was going to point that out. Yeah, they really do. So kind of cool to see a gadget uh, in the comic that was never on the show. Uh, let's see here. Oh, here's a, this is a Spock moment that I thought resembled Spock from the show pretty closely. He insists on... Uh, exact readings so that he can get the shot exactly right. So I, I felt that that was kind of a nod to the way Spock would operate on the show. Totally. Yeah. And another weird thing that kind of stuck out to me, this is, this is, this might be a little bit silly, but uh, there, there are some tumbleweed looking plants that roll around and I guess they're, they're herding some of these uh, dinosaur looking animals. And there's a reference made to them, operating like sheepdogs. Yes. And, you know, it was to me that it, I was wondering, would they still herd sheep on Earth the same way they do uh, today or in the past in Star Trek time? I mean... No, they, they'd probably be using some kind of robotic or drone-like technology. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, we, I'm, I'm, it's a, an interesting frame of reference that, uh, that uh, Kirk or Dr. McCoy would, would make a reference to sheepdogs. Mm -hmm. so, uh, any other thoughts on this section of the story no no okay moving along to the next part of the story so the blast from the enterprise destroys the pen and also creates a large explosion and we have uh, a little bit of suspense wondering if yeoman Rand survived the blast or not uh, a lot of explosions going on yeah and we have mccoy telling them or or kirk i think telling them to pray Yes, yes, that is very strange, and we'll, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit more in a second. I, I had that written down as well. So the, the landing party winds up rescuing uh, Janice Rand, and she's saved uh, from certain death uh, immediately by that blast from the Enterprise. It was a very last-minute thing. Uh, Kirk wants to get Beam back up to the ship. They bring him back up, and they're, they escape just in time before more of the spores or the, the mist would have overcome them and turned them into plants as well. So they're saved just in the nick of time in a very Star Trek-like fashion. So as you pointed out, uh, Kirk or – was it Kirk or was it McCoy? I wasn't sure who it was. It was hard to tell. It, it is hard to tell. It, uh, my, uh, my initial read, I thought it, it was uh, McCoy, but looking at it, it looks like it's probably Kirk because um, he's holding the tricorder. And it, and it seems like he's in the forefront position, which is, you know, where the captain would probably be. Yeah, you're right. Where that bubble, the word bubble falls is kind of closer to Kirk. So you're, you're, you're I'm, I'm going to go with that as well. So interesting, though, it's a reference is that uh, we hear very few uh, religious nods in Star Trek. So yeah. seeing the words pray written there was uh, a little bit jarring almost. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was one of those things that instantly jumped out as being very unlike the TV show. It, it, and we also get another um, very un Spock like moment where when they beam back up, we get thank a thousand star heavens. They made it. Yeah, I wrote that down, too. That was very weird. I one on a on a Spock level. That's weird. But just on a dialogue level, what does that even mean? <laughs> thousand star, star heavens. heavens what 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 are what are star heavens uh. oh so strange dialogue choices and very strange uh for for spock to say it uh on oh, on on page 23 panel number two uh kirk is holding a tricorder which i thought was cool that uh, it, it looks exactly like a tricorder from the show so nice yeah. that they brought that in he's also communicating 
via the tricorder. So he's not using a communicator. He's doing that video chat via a tricorder. Yeah, he's doing like uh, FaceTime. Yeah, he's doing me. Yeah. It's an Apple tricorder. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this this brings us to the end of the story. They arrive back on the Enterprise. You know, Spock insists that there are spores that can drift away from this planet and infect other planets. <laughs> this this line is very strange. It's, it's, we must. <laughs> We must orbit that hideous little globe until all foliage upon it is decimated by our laser beams. So uh, Spock has already laid in a course to completely destroy the entire planet. Uh, the, the Enterprise moves slowly over the surface and uses its, uh, its phasers or its uh, laser destruct beams to destroy all life on the planet. This is very, very weird. Uh, yeah, for a Star Trek it, it, episode, it almost seems like that bottom um, double panel where you get the total destruction occurring. It almost seems like something that would be taking place in the mirror universe. It's so odd to see the 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 Enterprise just completely laying waste to this planet. Yeah, d- definitely not prime directive material here. <laughs> no, <laughs> definitely not. So that's that's all out the window for this issue. But I, I, I thought that that was extremely unspock like as well. Yeah. For, for Spock to even suggest uh, destroying all life on a planet. So, especially yeah, and the this captain is a brand new really life. get to make that, make the call either. Yeah. Why is it Spock's call? Yeah. That is very strange. I, mean, I guess Kirk was on board with that. <laughs> but uh, that, that seems very, very non Spock to me. And it all seems, seems non Kirk. This yeah. seems like a, a conversation that would have had McCoy flipping out. Oh, yeah. Very, very weird. Um, page 26, panel 3, there's a weapon that resembles kind of like an assault rifle. One of the mm-hmm. one of the security guys is holding what looks like something like an AK-47 or something. Uh, I guess it's a phaser, but uh, it's a rifle. But it doesn't look like the, the famous phaser rifle from the pilot. No. You know, it's, it looks more like an Earth weapon. So, uh, any, any thoughts on the closeout ending of this uh, comic, Craig? Um, aside from the fact that it's it's probably the most un Star Trek like moment in the entire comic, it it really shows the divide between the TV show and the comic book in terms of probably giving the intended audience uh, the ending that they expect, as opposed to um, the TV show. I'm sure would have handled the ending of the episode much much differently. I definitely this this seems like one of those things that would have uh, hit Roddenberry's desk and gone for a rewrite. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, uh, closing out the comic, there's an interesting blurb about Captain Kirk at the end, and I thought I would read it. So it says, The Enterprise and her thousands of crewmen are under the command of James Kirk, a man of exceptional character and ability. He holds the loyalty and confidence of the entire crew. They would willingly follow him to the ends of the universe. Before their mission is completed, they may have to. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's doom and gloom. Yeah. <laughs> and and the, the Enterprise is thousands of crewmen, apparently. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, aside from the ending, though, I, I think this is a pretty cool start to the comic series. And I, I love the fact that we have some semblance to the show and other things are evolving. So, I mean, I've read a few of the, the, the issues after this, and it, it starts to cohere a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. So it's going to be fun to talk through the evolution of these. Uh, with you over the next few episodes. Yeah, yeah, and and right off the bat, you know, you alluded to the fact that they're able to do things here or they weren't limited by um, budgets. It really was sort of the the limits of their imagination. And, you know, right off the bat, the bat we get um, an, an alien race that one of your major complaints of the original series was, you know, with with uh, very few exceptions, we always sort of got the, the human-based... Mm-hmm. Um, alien race and here right off the bat we've got a, a very non-human a race of aliens exactly i love that i think that's great and, and, and it's something that we're going to see a little bit more of in the comics as we move forward so I'm, I'm excited to talk a little bit about those unfortunately though uh i i know we didn't talk about this ahead of time and i was thinking about our old the, the way we do our commentaries and our essential voting uh that we we did on the the original series i know these comics are not i guess considered canon or we you can argue and debate over whether or not the comics are canon 
but I thought it would still be kind of a cool discussion if we were to say, uh, are they uh, are they essential reads? Just kind of pointing out whether or not we learn anything interesting. I, I don't know if you're prepared to, to talk about that or not, Craig, but I, I would probably wind up saying that even though this is an interesting read, you know, from a historical perspective and, and, and the evolution of the franchise in a print format, if I were to weigh this against my original uh, essential criteria, this would be a non-essential, non-canon read. Yeah, and I would agree, just because I think at this point they didn't have enough of a handle on who the characters were and how they were supposed to act and overall what the the vision for that future or for, for Star Trek was. So I think it betrays some of the core principles of the characters and of the, of the show itself for it to be um, a, 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 an essential read. Agreed. Agreed. So that brings us to the end of episode 81 of the Tricorder Transmissions. This is our first uh, gold key comic coverage. Then we're going to keep doing the rest of these gold keys until we get to the animated series. And of course, we'll continue to do our uh, supplemental logs and we're going to still have a lot more with five-year missions. So uh, anything you want to say in closing before we sign off, Craig? No, I think this um, this was a, a fun little experiment and I look forward to, uh, to, to doing more. Oh yeah, absolutely. Me too. And I, I hope that the listeners out there who've been with us for our journey so far are going to stay on board for these comics. I, I, I anticipate a lot of fun conversations and I'd love to hear from some of you on Facebook and Twitter uh, at our normal places. So facebook.com slash the tricorder transmissions or TTT underscore pod on Twitter and the tricorder transmissions.com. And we'll be back on Wednesday with the next episode of what are little songs made of and uh, back on the following Sunday with another regular episode.